Every 90 seconds, someone is reported missing. Many return to their families. For others, something has gone seriously wrong. A teenager has vanished. A very old character for Joe. He would always contact someone, even if it was just like his mum or his sister. I straight away said Joe would not be gone for two days. For detectives and social workers, there are serious concerns for him. It was clearly identified in the missing person report that he got some vulnerabilities around learning difficulties. He was such a happy, go lucky young boy. What happens in the police investigation that follows? There was very little evidence that the pathologist could assist us with. What happens to the family at its heart? Obviously, it hit me like a ton of bricks. When missing, turns to murder. He was a happy, content little baby. Joe was number four. Lovely, chubby little, chunky little, um, happy little baby. When I first met Joe, he messaged me on social media and we became friends. First time I actually met him in person, I just saw a tall boy <laughs> with long, messy hair walking towards me. He was a very good gentleman and he made me smile and we really got along. He met Shannon and he had a lovely relationship with Shannon. It was kind of like meeting a toddler in a fully grown body. He was very hyperactive and always messing around, laughing, and he was a very bubbly person. Basically, me and Joe would spend our days just playing on, like, console and just spending time together, really, watching films. He's really into, like, zombies and, like, Walking Dead. Very big Marvel fan. He also loved WWE. WWE was his life. He loved it. Every weekend, every Monday. Joe was absolutely everything. He had some time where he would come in bounding and he'd be happy, bouncing about like Tigger and excited. He was so sensitive. He just wanted to be loved and he wanted to have friends around him and, and people around him that really cared about him. As a teenager, Joe was very young for his age. When he was about 16, I think I would have placed him around 12 years old. So I started to look into that potentially there's some ADHD, autism, something like that. His learning disability had not been recognised. We started looking into getting psychiatry help, some support with how to deal with his behaviours and that's when things became, became a little bit more challenging for me, especially as a single mum. My relationship with Joe's dad, I didn't like his discipline methods. We couldn't agree on that, we couldn't agree. So we broke up and there I was on my own with the boys. Even though it was just the three of us, um, I do have some, some, some lovely memories, some great photos. It wasn't a very long period, and it was sprinkled with some difficulties. Obviously, because of being a single mum, you know, depression, behaviours of the children. Um, but, yeah, I just needed support. With continued strain on mum Sam, Joe ends up living with his father. But when that doesn't work out, Joe moves into foster care. As he got older, about 15, he started wanting more contact with me. He realised that his older brother was having that, and because he'd left foster care by that age. And I think Joe wanted the same. Joe moves back to live with his mum, and she tries hard to get him more support as he approaches adulthood. I can remember saying to them, is Joe going to be able to live a normal life and be able to live independently? They told me that they got a flat there and they'd take them and they'd stay with them for a week to teach them how to cook and different things. 
my fight for a diagnosis really began when Joe became independent at the age of 16. Because I felt without that, he wasn't going to get the right support, the right accommodation. He was going to be around the wrong people. Everything mattered around a diagnosis. He came to the hostel as a way to sort of give him um, semi-permanent uh, accommodation and help him to build the living skills that he needed to move on independently. He moved in with my nan and granddad and then Joe became part of the family. Joe and Shannon lived together for a period of time, around eight or nine months. And then sadly, that broke down. So we contact the council and Joe was put back into the bed and breakfast at Kingsley Guesthouse. I really didn't like it at all. It was another homeless environment with maybe people just released from prison, lots of drugs. Joe was there with no support. Over the next few years, Sam tries to get more help for her son. I went to social services and said, look, I started making some really serious complaints. I'd got the MPs involved. I had endless emails, endless. I had councillors involved, head of the Ipswich Borough Council, all these people involved to try and get Joe support and accommodation. Basic, basic stuff. It's while 22-year-old Joe is staying in temporary accommodation, he fails to contact his social worker for two days. He's reported missing. The police contacted me and said, um, asked me had I seen Joe, and I said no. Um, and they'd said he hadn't been seen since the Wednesday. When they told me that, I straight away said Joe would not be gone for two days. very out of character for Joe. He would always contact someone, even if it was just like his mum or his sister, but he would always contact them, especially because he would go and see his sister at least once a week to go and spend time with her and his nephews. He loved them, like, it was just different. Like, he just vanished. Joe's mum contacts some of her son's local friends. One of them is Luke Greenland. He just kept saying that he didn't know where he was. There might be somewhere that he might be. And I said, well, can you go and try and find if he's there? And then he told me he was out of Ipswich, but that he would, uh, when he came back, he would go and look. A period of time went by, Joe was still missing. I met him in the hostel, the bed and breakfast. That's how we got together as friends. And I told him I had autism. We kind of like clicked straight away and we become so good friends. We were very tight, very tight friends. Joe Pooley suffered with a range of learning difficulties. He was in social care for most of his life traveling between multiple sites over and over again, that ultimately meant that his care was largely insufficient. Joe is a vulnerable person, making this a serious case for police. He'd previously been missing a few times over the course of a few years. It was clearly identified in the missing person report that he'd got some vulnerabilities around learning difficulties and vulnerable to being exploited and taking advantage of because of those disabilities that he had. Initially, you kind of gather who are his close friends. Does he have a partner, a girlfriend? Does he have uh, places that he goes to? And so all of those inquiries were being followed up. I was contacting people that knew him or knew friends of him and just getting a lot of mixed messages and running around and I was trying to work. I was trying to hold down my job, still going to work, knowing that he was missing. 
There was a knock on my door and it was a police officer. He had like a photo of like Joe on like a poster and he was like, um, sorry to bother you, um, have you seen Joe recently? And asked me questions and I told him I hadn't seen him. The appeals to find Joe are circulated across media platforms. I learned that Joe was missing um, from the local news. I read the paper and I saw it in there. My first thoughts about, about it was disbelief because he was such a happy, go-lucky young boy when he was at Sanctuary. And, you know, they, it went straight back to those memories of what I knew of him. Then the media reports, and it was just all sort of news reports. There was nothing solid from anyone in particular. Me and my mum started to post photos and statuses on social media asking if anyone had seen him around like Ipswich or if, like know where he would be or had seen someone like who had seen him, etc. My best friend would go around and ask like the people he knew because he knew quite a few people. Um, basically just asking anyone and everyone and every time we would go out we'd be looking for him and just looking around and just would never find him. I thought to myself, the only person that he would spend like this long with would be his best friend. His best friend wasn't in Ipswich at the time for him to see. He had no access to his best friend. I was in prison. It was uh, three weeks before I was due to be released. As police work closely with Joe's friends, family and support network, it becomes clear that finding him isn't going to be straightforward. Joe uh, was chaotic in some respects. We know that he went through a lot of phones. Sometimes he would lose them. Sometimes he would sell them. He did have a heavy cannabis habit, and quite often he would sell possessions, items, in order to get the money to buy cannabis. Somebody walking along the river path in London Road in Ipswich saw what they believed was a body floating in the river. So police attended and confirmed that yes, there was a body floating in, in the river at that point in time. The Fire and Rescue Service were called to try and assist in removing that body. My daughter rang me and said that her best friend had been at the range and there was some police cars there and they were pulling a body out of the river. As you can imagine, at the time of him being found, he had been uh, immersed in water for close to a week and therefore he wasn't readily identifiable, sadly. So when a person is found and they're not immediately identifiable, we would automatically go to our missing person records. We have uh, records, we have people's DNA, we have people's fingerprints. On this occasion, we were able to uh, take Joe's fingerprints and we were able to identify him positively through his fingerprints. I knew it would be Joe. I then just spent the day waiting for them to come and tell me. And they came at eight o'clock and told me that was Joe. Obviously, it hit me like a ton of bricks. When somebody tells you, everything just changes from that moment. I was upstairs in my room when I got the message, and then I didn't know what to do, so I was, like, trying to go downstairs, but my little sister was still awake, so I didn't want to upset her with my brothers. <laughs> so then I kind of, like, just sat on the steps and until my mum saw me. And then when she saw me, she like saw me crying. <laughs> and then obviously proceeded to try and get hold of Joe's mum. And she like obviously Sam wouldn't answer the phone, but she messaged me on obviously social media and 
said, I'm so sorry, Shannon, but Joe's dead. <laughs> With the body now confirmed as Joe's, police want to know how he ended up in the water. When I first heard what had happened to Joe, I was stunned. The implication was that he hurt himself, possibly, or it was an accident. My thoughts of Joe was just he was this happy young boy, and the thought of him being so upset and hurting himself in that manner wasn't the Joe that I knew. Detectives, hoping that the autopsy might provide answers, are disappointed. There is no forensic evidence in this case because obviously Joe had been immersed in water and therefore that just didn't exist. The pathology, uh, owing to the level of decomposition with Joe because of his immersion in water for several days, there was very little evidence that the pathologist could assist us with. And then same with CCTV, because of the uh, lack of coverage around that particular area and the quality of some of the CCTV that was available, there was limited scope around that. The cordon was removed within 12 hours. I suppose there probably wasn't a lot of evidence. You know, he didn't have any injuries. This is the, the area where Joe was last seen where Joe spent his last minutes of his life. Even though Joe and I didn't spend a great deal of time together in his childhood years, he was my son. We did have an incredible bond. Sometimes it was challenging because of his learning disability, but I did everything I could to help Joe and to make our relationship easier. But that bond was never, that bond was always there and was never going to break. And I still feel that bond. I know Joe adored me and I adored him. With Joe's body and the canal where he was found not giving any clues, police look into every aspect of his last days alive. The uh, officers who had been investigating it up to uh, the point that I started to review it, they'd seen and spoken to a number of people, they'd uh, taken some statements. They'd also gathered some call data records from Joe's mobile telephone number to sort of see who he'd been in contact with and what sort of patterns that told us about. One possible lead is a local person who has information won't make a statement to police. They'd already spoken to a witness who had given us some information that Joe may have been killed. And that witness hadn't committed that into evidence at that time. DCI Carl Nightingale starts to work through all possibilities. We were very quickly able to rule out the medical episode because his medical records and because the pathology didn't support that he'd suffered any medical episode at all. Joe making quips, comments about, I'm going to kill myself, but it became clear quite quickly. Joe would say these things, but sometimes it would be for attention. When he started to look at, actually, could this have been an accidental set of circumstances? because we were able to establish through witnesses that Joe could swim. We knew that he'd only got lightweight clothing on. We knew that from toxicology levels in due course that he actually wasn't heavily under the influence of, uh, of any drugs or alcohol. We also knew that the, the time of year was quite warm, so the uh, impact of cold water was less prevalent. And so there are a number of things that, can, and that started to sort of knock these hypotheses out and reduce the likelihood of them which then helped me focus very much on this being a murder inquiry. A post-mortem concludes that immersion in water is the likely cause of Joe Pooley's death. 
Now it is down to Carl and his team to find out who killed him. There were a lot of rumours to begin with. Joe had a circle of friends that all lived within sort of reasonable proximity of him, just within a few minutes of walking distance. Out of the many questioned, some of those friends are Sean Palmer, Becky West Davidson, and Luke Greenland, who Joe's mum had already spoken to when she was trying to track down her missing son. When I'd rung Luke to say, when did you last see Joe? One of the stories that, that Luke told me that, that Joe had gone outside for, for, a, for a spliff and he'd never come back up. Police meticulously continue to scan CCTV from near the crime scene and the wider area when they come across footage of Luke Greenland. He was in a relationship with a lady called Lisa Marie Smith. Those two were inseparable. Their relationship uh, hadn't been going for very long, but it was very, very intense. Uh, and so uh, we uh, got images of uh, them on CCTV, being together on the day of the 6th of August. Uh, we got evidence from witnesses that said that they were very uh, close to each other. At Joe's memorial service, Sam meets another friend of her son's. Becky West Davidson. Becky West Davidson had contacted me after Joe died, saying how much she adored Joe, how much she missed him. She was so sad that he'd passed. I then invited her to Joe's memorial, and I cuddled her and tried to make her feel better. She just didn't seem, you know, upset. She was laughing. She had like a sinister kind of look on her. She just didn't seem bothered. She didn't generally, her emotion just wasn't the same as everyone else. My mum and my best friend, they spoke to her and she said that she was a friend of Joe and that she had known him for years. But she was also Joe's ex-girlfriend. I was like, okay, <laughs> didn't know anything of this. But wanting to do all she can to help, Shannon turns detective herself. I remember one of his passwords I put into the account, opened straight away and all his messages came. There was one conversation with Luke that stuck in my head. He was trying to get Joe to come out and meet him at night. He wouldn't go because of his autism and his anxiety. He'd get too scared because he's vulnerable. Shannon hacked Joe's Facebook, and that was when we found the messages from Rebecca threatening Joe, saying, I'm going to see you dead. They'd had an argument on that day, and she'd threatened Joe. She'd made out that they had a good friendship, and she terribly missed Joe. So I contacted her and said, what about these messages? You didn't tell me about this. And she said, oh, I didn't think it would matter. I said, well, I think you should go to the police. She told me she would, but she never did. I contacted the police immediately. These messages suggest that Joe was in risk of his life. The police officers that were in charge of the whole case at the beginning of it, who I spoke to, and had my interviews with, etc. They took my phone and gave me a replacement. Digital forensics play a key part in most investigations, full stop. But in every homicide, there will be some aspect of digital forensic work, whether that be through call data, seizing of mobile phones and analysis of phones, uh, computers, that there'll be various different forms which you can sort of uh, interrogate and sort of gather evidence from. Becky West Davidson had a long history of violence, uh, albeit at a relatively low level. Luke Greenland had a history of violence as well. And so, you know, we knew that these were two violent individuals. Uh, we knew that Becky had been violent towards Joe in the past because of what she'd put in a message. 
these people were quite linked uh, incestuously almost through sort of sexual relationships, orgies, that type of stuff. Joe fell into that crowd, not necessarily involved in those types of activities, but those were the people that he was mixing with. Luke Greenland was uh, known uh, and by his own admission was a drug dealer. Again, that's probably where that link comes in uh, between uh, Joe and Luke because of the cannabis habit that he had. There was some sort of sexual jealousy as well. One of which was that sort of aspect as to whether uh, Joe had had sex with Becky West Davidson on the night of the 5th into the 6th. So perhaps some sexual uh, jealousy, uh, some tension there. <laughs> which led to threats being made to Joe on the 6th of August. Crucially, police find video footage of Joe recorded that day. There is CCTV imagery of him leaving the Kingsley guest house. He's quite uncertain. He wouldn't leave the Kingsley guest house late at night unless he knew who he was going to meet and where they were. I had been to see social services a few months prior to that and made a big complaint about where Joe was living and that he was unsupported. There are a lot of, a lot of dangerous people around him and he was at risk of every form of abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, financial abuse. He found it difficult at times. He did struggle because all he wanted was that love and attention and true friendship. And unfortunately, when you're living in that kind of environment, you don't always know whether people's intentions are honourable and honest. And I think at times he found himself in situations that, that maybe were negative. A few people took the mickey out of him. So I got in a few scrapes over that. You know, I got into a few punch ups. But that's how I was. He needed to be looked after. Detectives are building up a picture of Joe's troubled life and the people around him. The people he called friends really weren't his friends. They were just the type of people to dare him to do things and to get him, like, to egg him on to do bad things. And I didn't like that, and I could see, like, he wasn't eating properly either, and every time I saw him, he was just getting thinner and thinner. Joe suffered from what I would consider a mate crime, which is a specific form of disability hate crime. It's different from general hate crimes where you're targeted because someone actually hates what you are. They hate the color of your skin or they hate your sexual orientation. You're being targeted because of your vulnerability. And that means that these crimes are often perpetrated by people very close to you, friends, sometimes family members. They would, like, um, encourage him to, like, do drugs and, um, like, to, they would only want to be around him when he had money. They wouldn't speak to him when he didn't have no money. Behind his back, they'll be talking about him, and even in front of him, like, they'll belittle him and just, you know, like a bully would. Police release Sean Palmer and Becky West Davidson, pending further investigation. They also check the phone records of Luke Greenland and his friend Lisa Marie Smith from the day Joe Pooley went missing. We were able to attribute mobile telephone numbers to both. Luke and also uh, to Lisa. We knew that both of them had separately been in contact with Joe and therefore we knew that they had effectively been acting together and where one had gone, the other had gone. I had Joe cremated and then I've just kept hold of his ashes, and they didn't really feel anywhere appropriate, really. Joe never really settled anywhere or really had any roots anywhere where I felt that he would want to be or to go. I 
I don't feel ready to part with Joe. It feels a bit too final. I helped carry the coffin into the crematorium. I was at the front with his brother. Uh, it did upset me quite a lot. His mum, she got um, bikers. I think there was probably about 50 like bikers. They followed his horse and hearse around half of Ipswich. His coffin, it was all like WWE themed with all the wrestlers and all that on there. There was loads of people that like showed up kind of thing. It was beautiful. The music that was played was all his favourite songs that he would listen to. It was kind of like... all of us just being there like for one last farewell for him kind of thing. He's carried on me in, in this tattoo here, where I have his ashes tattooed into me. He's carried on me here, and I have his ashes, some of his ashes, around my neck. So he's close to my heart, very close to my heart. While the town pays its respects to Joe, detectives are working to gather further evidence against the suspects. Becky West Davidson was already uh, on the radar as such because she had already provided a statement to the police purporting to be Joe's uh, ex-girlfriend, somebody who cared for him, somebody who supported him, and therefore she was uh, in the equation. Becky West Davidson had previously been a tenant of Sanctuary Supported Living. I remember Becky to be quite loud. She was quite brash and at times could be quite, quite rude to people. But when I reviewed her statement, She'd intentionally concealed things. She'd hidden things with the intention to deceive and mislead us and take us away from what had happened to Joe. The police continue to make public appeals for information. And people start to make statements against Sean Palmer and Luke Greenland. What is really, really powerful and what's really compelling are the number of witnesses that came forward to tell us that they had received partial admissions, partial confessions. We received some information that Sean Palmer's family member had come forward and said that Sean had made a confession to her about killing Joe. Also separately, Luke Greenland, as he was at the time, Sebastian Smith, also had made a confession to her. That's really powerful because the similarities in their evidence as well is really compelling. Police question Sean Palmer and again bring in Becky West Davidson. I didn't want to lose any potential evidence, and I felt that she had a key phone in her possession that we really, really wanted. We did go and arrest her. She did have a key device, and that proved to be really, really valuable and evidence uh, in due course. Now detectives have Becky's phone. They can deduce even more circumstantial evidence relating to Joe's death. When we looked at call data records, uh, it was quite clear that after the night of the 6th of August, that none of the defenders had any contact with Joe. That really stood out, that actually the interactions between Becky and Luke ceased for a period of days. The fact that Becky West Davidson had completely factory reset her mobile telephone to delete all data from it so that we couldn't access the messaging and uh, some of the data that would have been incriminating on there. So we were able to use a number of those sort of negatives in a, in a positive form. But police can retrieve and view videos previously filmed on her smartphone. I was shocked. I was. When the police arrested Re Re Rebecca and took her phone, on her phone they found a video of somebody coming into her flat, beating up one of her ex-boyfriends that she'd lured to her flat. That's the type of person she is. Very quickly became apparent how unliked this lady was. I started getting all sorts of messages from different people who had had contact with her in the past, different things that she'd done to people, um, how dangerous she was.
This was a, a particularly difficult case because it was so long and so protracted. Without those foundation stones around forensic evidence and pathology and CCTV of clarity and so on, it was very difficult. All four suspects are interviewed multiple times. DCI Carl Nightingale is edging towards a joint enterprise charge for Joe's death. There were certainly some admissions made as to levels of involvement and how far people were prepared to sort of accept what they were, what they were party to. And during one of the interviews, uh, when we interviewed uh, Sebastian Smith, uh, he did make uh, an admission to the fact that he had assaulted Joe. And as a result of that assault, Joe had gone into the water. CPS did a really positive and really good thing. that They appointed a barrister to review the case. And he spent a long time poring over the evidence that we'd submitted. And it was really uh, following that that uh, we received that positive decision to charge four people with Joe's murder. We say that each person played their own part and therefore each person had to stand trial because there was a realistic prospect of convicting them. I did find it really difficult that there was two women involved, especially somebody who portrayed to be somebody that had been a friend to Joe. The Crown Prosecution Service is satisfied with the police evidence. All four defendants are to appear at Ipswich Crown Court. The first day of the trial, we sat there and listened to the things that they were saying. They started off with like the relationships between them. In the court case, the sexual jealousy element of, of, of the crime was indicated as the prime motivator. Luke and Rebecca had this weird relationship. There was lots of sex going on. Luke was having all different sorts of sex things at his flat. They were all sleeping with each other. But that's only part of the story. Joe was targeted because of his vulnerability. He was embroiled in that sex act due, in part, to his vulnerability. You must understand that their ability to control him, their ability to uh, make him do their bidding, and ultimately their ability to convince him to, to take part in activities that led to, uh, led to his eventual demise. The jury is told about an argument between Becky West Davidson and Joe Pooley. It would prove fatal. They'd slept together the night before. He'd said something or done something that she didn't like. What started as a bit of an argument very, very rapidly escalated, completely out of proportion. And on the way home, whilst he was walking back to Kingsley Guest House, she contacted Luke and stirred Luke up to hunt him down. Part of the plan involved persuading Joe that he had nothing to fear from them. Joe was lured, we would say, from his hotel room, given the reassurance that all of the uh, hatred and all the vitriol that occurred during the course of that day had passed and subsided. They were seen on CCTV outside Luke could be seen with a mobile phone in his hand and the light on the phone was on. And that was Rebecca West Davison on that phone call. Lisa used her mobile phone to ring Joe and say, come and have a spliff with us. Luke used Lisa to lure Joe out, knowing that Lisa could probably make Joe feel comfortable. Sean then joins them, who's been waiting in the car park. After trying to get Joe drunk at one of their apartments, the gang then walked him home, but he's led along the dark canal paths where they attacked him. Which results in him being thrown or put into the water and subsequently drowned. There's some variation as to whether he was held under or whether he was put into the water unconscious. Either which way, it's murder.
Throughout the trial, the accused not only appeared to be in denial, but a disruptive. Didn't want to listen to this, didn't like listening to that. Throwing books across the courtroom. Petulant children storming out of the courtroom, throwing, throwing things, shouting, just, yeah, what I expected, really. They were laughing and joking with each other. They really didn't, it just didn't seem like they were dead. Their whole, like, demeanour, it just, like, they didn't feel guilty, and you could just tell by looking at them, they didn't seem like they cared what they had done. Becky was not present when Joe was killed. We know that she was at home. But murder is a very complicated offence, and so you don't have to physically be present when somebody is killed, but actually you are jointly involved. It's a joint enterprise. You have done something positive to ensure that somebody is killed, uh, or at least caused really serious harm, in order to have that intent to kill. Becky is very clear from uh, a lot of the phone data, the phone communications, and a lot of the social media interactions that she had very much formed that intent. She had stoked the fires. Even friends and family are called to testify against some of the accused. As a mum, everyone wants to know what happened to their child, and that's exactly why Sean Palmer's mum gave evidence against her own son because she felt that every mum deserves to know what happened to their child. I wrote her a card saying thank you so much and how much I respected her for doing that. Because it must have been horrendous, really difficult for her. The trial of the four accused is gruelling. The trial lasted for just shy of six months. Each of the four defendants obviously had their legal teams. They had a lead barrister, Queen's Counsel, in three of the cases, and a junior barrister. And the level of intrusion, the level of detail, uh, the scrutiny that we face for any major investigation, any homicide, is absolutely incredible. There was a lot, a lot of evidence, and when you tied it all together, to me, it was just obvious. But it did take 50 hours for the jury to come back. The jury first acquits one of the girls, Lisa Marie Smith. And the verdict was Rebecca, Wes Davison, Sean Palmer, and Luke Greenland were found guilty of Joe's murder. The jury gives an 11 out of 12 majority verdict. I just remember looking around and I see like Joe's dad and all the other people and I remember coming out of the courtroom and I see Joe's mum and she had tears and eyes and everything. And it, just, it was like a massive weight. <laughs> On the day of sentencing, Sam reads out her victim impact statement. I wanted them to hear that they were bullies, that they, they were bullies. And, and they grouped together and murdered, bullied and murdered a defenseless, vulnerable young man. They chose to have him there that night. They chose to do what they did to him. And that makes them really, really dangerous, sick people in my book. Luke Greenland was given 21 years. Sean Palmer was given 18 years. Rebecca West Davison, even though she wasn't there, she was on the telephone, she was given 17 years. It was in no way justice for Joe for me because the biggest part of a lot of this story was what led up to it. Despite Joe's killers being brought to justice, an initial inquest into his murder doesn't give Sam all the answers she wants. We nearly had to fight for a judicial review to get the inquest reopened. But I'm glad that it all came out and that it's now public knowledge and that people are aware of the failings out there in the system. For me, the most significant failings were the failure for Joe to be diagnosed 
with his autism, learning disability. To me, that diagnosis was paramount to Joe's support and care. Once you've got a diagnosis, everything else follows. So that was the biggest thing that Joe, they failed to ever have Joe diagnosed. The failing to find Joe suitable accommodation, and it made him more vulnerable because they put him around people that were of great risk to Joe. She was trying to get him more help when he was alive, and she was really trying hard. The people that they were supposed to guide him, help him, look after him, just didn't do it. And now he's dead, they're making recommendations that, they, that things should change. There are also failures in the criminal justice system in relation to the killer. For example, he was out on licence and he actually removed his tag. It was very difficult to find out that Joe had been failed by the Ministry of Justice by not protecting him as a member of the public when they released Luke Greenland, knowing that he was a violent, a violent criminal and he posed a high risk to the public, yet they proceeded to let him out on a tag and did not monitor him properly. They failed to recall him by a series of blunders and that left Luke to be out on the streets to put people like Joe at risk. The fact that you have one person who shouldn't have been out on the streets, who should have been in prison, goes to show that obviously the criminal justice system doesn't always work. This is Christchurch Park. It's an area where Joe used to like to come with his friends and be a young lad, sit and smoke a spliff. I thought it was important to have a memorial here, somewhere that we could come and remember where Joe liked to come. Park uh, to me was important to have Joe's name and the date obviously of his birth and it says take the weight off your feet and come and chill on Joe's seat and I, those were my words I chose those because I thought that represented Joe quite quite well. I believe yeah he's in a happier place now there's no bullies around him there's no one taking his money off him. And, yeah, he's in a better place now. Every year on his birthday, we let off balloons. We come here, the family, his friends, come and place flowers, come and sit here and spend some time thinking about Joe enjoying the park. Not only did they steal my son, of that they had no right to take away his right to life that fateful August night. Each one was meant to be his friend, or so each of them claimed, and able to defend himself, and that's why poor Joe dies. It's murder and they took my son. The sentence should be life. <laughs>